Hello everyone, welcome to Virtual BSD CAN. I'm Michael Lucas, and we will be talking about DNSSEC. Who am I? I've been a Unix guy since somewhere around 1986, 1987. If I had known how important Unix was going to be in my life, I would have noted the date I got my first account. Anyway, I've written a bunch of sysadmin books, and the latest is, coincidentally enough, about DNSSEC. So what's in this talk? First, what's the problem? What's going on? What are we trying to solve? Second, why DNSSEC solves these problems? What are the prerequisites to using DNSSEC? We'll then look at the types of records involved in DNSSEC. Uh, how to look at DNSSEC in the DNS, how to sign zones, how to do basic troubleshooting, and finally, how to roll over your keys. So what's the problem? DNS is the glue that makes the internet usable. It maps host names to IP addresses. The main problem with it is that it is gullible. It was created in 1983, and the internet was completely different back then. We had college students and nuclear missiles, and that was it. Today's internet bears no resemblance to that in any way. And a, a spoofed DNS entry can lead directly to an intrusion. Now. DNS does beat the hosts file that was used beforehand. And DNS security extensions work to solve the gullibility problem. It adds cryptographic verification and a chain of trust to DNS. So what's the problem with DNSSEC then? Well, first of all, it's got a bad rep. It was first created in the 90s. The initial standards were finalized around 2005. And in between those years, it thrashed around a lot. And some versions of DNSSEC were difficult in every meaning of the word. Also, a lot of the early software wasn't very good by modern standards, at least. And old software never dies, how-tos never die, and this, so this reputation sticks around forever in forums. And lastly, there is the it's always DNS problem. If you break DNS, everything breaks. Touching it scares people. But if you want to keep your stuff from being spoofed on the internet, uh, it's the industry standard now. So what do you have to know and have before you can start working with DNSSEC? First of all, you have to have a test zone. Start with a domain that doesn't matter. Back in the 90s, they were $100 a year. Today, they cost about a sneeze you do not need uh, to work with DNSSEC initially in your production domain. That generates what we call outages. Secondly, you need a registrar that supports DS records. That's pretty common these days, but you'll want to verify. Third, secure your name servers. You want packet filters, SSH key authentication, separate authoritative and recursive servers, secure your zone transfers, and make sure your clock is correct. Some people object to NTP. You don't have to use that, but you do need a way to nail down the system time within a minute or so. Also, you need to know some DNS basics. Uh, What's a recursive server? How does the whole decentralization thing work? Or depending on your perspective, how does the centralization and hierarchical authority work? You need to have some idea what a few basic records are like A, NS, MX, and so on. 
All of my examples use bind. So, the DNSSEC chain of trust. The trust anchor is a cryptographic key, very much like that used in X509 certificates. And this is coded in the software itself. And there are protocols to update it when necessary. So basically the trust anchor signs the root zone. The root zone signs .io and .io signs my domain mwl.io and then I sign an actual host. It's more complicated than this, but we will look at details in a bit. Anytime you talk about uh, trust and chains of trust, you have keys. Each stage of the chain of trust has a key, and there are three different kinds of keys. There's a key signing key, and this signs the record that contains the the zones keys. There's a zone signing key that signs the entries in the zone. So basically, the parent zone uh, has signed the key signing key, the key signing key has signed the zone signing key, and the zone signing key signs the actual records. Uh, if you think this is complicated, yes, it kind of is. You can also have a combined signing key, which is a single key that performs both functions. The parent zone points at the keys at the combined signing key, and the combined signing key signs records. We'll talk about which you should use a little later. Each key has a tag, a short numerical identifier that is unique within a zone. So what about DNSSEC records? Well, the first thing you have to know about is the resource record set. This is not exclusive to DNSSEC, but it is the thing that DNSSEC signs. For example, if you look at Google's uh, website and you get the IP address for its web servers, you get these six IPs. This is one resource record set. You entered a query, you got six addresses back as a single unit. On the other hand, look at my web server. Fortunately, I only need one. I, I thank you for not buying so many books that I need a farm. And that's also a resource record set, one entry. The, the most obvious record is perhaps the DNS key. This is the KSK, ZSK, and or combined signing key. And what you'll see is the DNS key entry. Oh. Sorry, folks. And then uh, the actual gibberish of the key itself. And usually you will get some plain text interpretation at the end of the line. Then there's your DS record. Now the DS record is the thing that glues a parent zone and a child zone's keys together. It's a hash of the zone's public key uh, as given in the DNS key record, but it's in the parent zone. For example, here I've pulled up the DS record for my domain, and this is actually in the .io domain. And finally, there's the resource record signature. And this is the digital signature of a resource record set as signed by the key. One thing you'll note is that the validity dates are shown in the record itself. You, you can see the dates right here at the beginning. This is why your time is so important. And finally, there's the NSEC record. If you're trying to prevent spoofing, proof that something does not exist is just as important as 
saying something exists. And NSEC shows that what you asked for isn't there. There's also NSEC 3, which is more private, but has some uh, other complications with it. So here we have a full chain of trust. We trust the trust anchor at the top of this. It's coded into our software. The trust anchor signs the root zone key signing key. The root key signing key signs the root zone signing key, which in turn signs the DS record for the IO zone. And that, that is still in the root zone. Your, your client jumps down to the IO zone, uh, looks for the DNS key record, sees that it matches what's in the DS record, and says, great, that's valid. So the, the IO key signing key matches the, uh, signs the zone signing key, which signs the DS record for my domain. And we, we follow that same little dance that my domain here just has a CSK because I am a low value target. And you get a signed record that says authoritatively, my MX record is this host. That way you can send me email and the intruder pump promptly compromises the email. Now, in practice, these chains are built from the bottom up. The upper levels are cached, which reduces the amount of number crunching. The first time you access a .io domain, you have to go through and compute everything. But the second time, those five first steps are in cache and are already trusted. This full process is called validation. Now, each of these keys has a private key. Everybody at this conference has probably heard too many times that you should protect your private keys. If someone seals your private key, they can create valid DNS entries for your zone and spoof you. There are four common ways to protect your keys. They include offline signing, which is what they use for the trust anchor in the root zone, which they copy the file to a flash drive. They carry it over to an offline machine. Uh, multiple people turn keys, physical keys, much like you'd think that they should use for launching nuclear missiles. And they sign the zone, carry it back and recopy the file. A stealth master, which is your real authoritative name server, is behind a firewall. It's tightly protected. It's the only host with a private key and it pushes records out to public secondary servers. There's hardware security modules, which are cool. Uh, they mean that your private key cannot be extracted from the hardware. And there's the traditional method of just saying nothing will go wrong and everything is going to be fine which is used more widely than any of us would like to admit. Use any of those methods you like, just be honest about what you're doing. So how do you look at DNSSEC? Uh, I'm gonna use dig, drill is also fine. NSLOOKUP in general is not. The NSLOOKUP program has been deprecated, forked, resurrected, redeprecated, folded, spindled, and mutilated many times by many people. And I find it impossible to trust that any given implementation of NSLOOKUP actually works or that the implementation installed is what came with the operating system. So use dig, use drill, I'm choosing to use dig. Now, if you're looking at DNSSEC, you cannot query the authoritative server directly. The uh, drill and dig will not perform validation there. Uh, validation is for recursive servers. 
So here I'm looking at my domain, I'm adding a DNSSEC flag, and I'm querying Google's name servers. And it comes back with this AD flag that says, hey, this validates. Now, if nothing comes back, add the plus CD flag to disable validation. Now the domain dnssecfailed.org exists to serve as a bad example. And if you query it, you will find that uh, there, there's nothing there. If you disable validation, that you do get a response. It's because the DNSSEC here is deliberately broken and does not validate. So what kind of errors do you get? with DNSSEC. There were really three. The serve fail error means that your recursive name server did not have an answer cached and it could not retrieve an answer. Now this might mean the authoritative name server is down, it might be a validation failure. You have to dig dip deeper. There's NX domain which means nothing by that name exists. And there's also no error, but no answer. Something by that name exists, but not what you asked for. A good example for that is if you query for an MX record for my website, www.mwl.io, no record of, type of that type exists. The MX record is at the domain level, not the host level. But there are A and quad A records for the, that name. So some useful dig options here. Plus CD disables checking. Plus multi breaks the output across multiple lines, which is very handy with these long horrible cryptographic strings. Plus DNSSEC shows the DNSSEC details and the plus no crypto hides those long horrible strings that you really didn't want to see. It literally puts omitted in the output. So how would you sign a zone? Well, start with a test zone. Decide how you're going to sign it. Tell named e to sign the zone. Verify it works and then publish a DS record. Again, use a test zone. What kind of key should you use? If this is your first time playing with DNSSEC, a CSK should be fine. If you're doing a personal zone, a low impact e-business, a CSK should still be fine. Uh, a, a site like mine where uh, I have my own e-book store where I take credit card numbers but I hand that all off to PayPal and Stripe. There's nothing there worth hijacking. I, I could use a CSK CSK there. Now, if you're actually storing credit cards, if you're subject to HIPAA or federal regulations, or people might sue you for real money, if you if you are PayPal, not not do you use PayPal? Are you PayPal? You really want to use a KSK and a ZSK, because you don't want to wind up in court and having the simpler keys used against you somehow. But we're going to start with a CSK. Now, with keys and caching, caching is the bane of DNS as well as its greatest strength. Uh, timing becomes very important in DNS because of those caches. So this gives us four possible key states uh, once you take caching into account. Rumored means uh, that the key has, has been published in the parent zone, uh, but it's not yet fully cached everywhere. Folks might have it, they might not. Uh, omnipresent means that it's published long enough that everyone should have access to it. Unretentive means it's on its way out and hidden means it's not yet published or it's long time unpublished. 
So uh, hidden keys are visible to debugging, but they're not part of validation. Now, everybody has their favorite way to manage zones, especially in something like bind, where you can choose between static and dynamic zones. Uh, I, I am violently attached to static files. NS update bit me once in 1998, I think it was, and I still haven't forgiven it. So now DNSSEC has to add entries to a zone. So a dynamic zone requires no special configuration. Static zone files require a special config where NAMD can write to the zone file directory. It will create a dynamic version of the zone from your static file uh, and use that to serve the zone. And then when you update your static file, it recreates everything. The upshot of this is the serial number shown to the world might not match what is in your zone. Bind also uses something called a key and signing policy. And this includes all of the stuff that DNSSEC uses. Uh, what kind of keys you have, how often should signatures be re-signed and recreated, when should a key expire, how do you replace the key, it's all defined in a bind policy. The default policy uses a CSK because there are far more tiny zones than there are HIPAA compliant monoliths. And to enable DNSSEC on a zone, you just assign a policy, reload the zone, boom. You will see key files generated in the key directory. You see here, I've assigned a specific key directory for this zone. Uh, if you have dozens of zones and you dump all of the keys in the working directory, it quickly becomes confusing. So once you've done that, what does bind think is going on? Well, you can use RNDC to check and see the status of the zone. The DS shows it's rumored because it's, it's published in your zone, but the parent zone does not have a DS record yet. Uh, if you run dig plus DNSSEC on your zone, you should see RR SIGs and DNS keys and all of that's good stuff. Once all that's done, you can publish a DS record. You go to your domain register and say, hey, here's my D here is my public key. It will either ask for the DS record in specific or it will ask you for the actual DNS key record. You wait for all the caches that around the world to expire before relying on DNSSEC. And poof, DNSSEC is there. And then tell bind that you published the DS record in the parent zone. Now, th this leads to a complication. If you have a DS record, your zone must be signed with a matching key, otherwise the zone will not validate. Must. P must. If you do any of these bad things, your zone will stop validating. Publishing a DS record before your zone is signed. If you remove DNSSEC from the zone while the DS is still live, you fail to validate. If you get frustrated, delete everything and start over as per the grand sysadmin tradition. If validation failure. Or if your clock is bad and the time, zamp, time stamps on the zone no longer uh, are valid for the rest of the world's common time. So, don't do that. Okay. Debugging. Real nerds only need dig and date. Uh, however, I'm a wimp. 
I use tools. That's why they exist. Two things can, that you do can break DNSSEC. Key mismatches and incorrect clocks. The first thing you have to do is separate DNS errors from DNSSEC. If, you're non, if your authoritative server is no longer authoritative for your zone, that's still bad. Uh, if your network is bad, then it could cause DNSSEC failures. And it, it could even be a bug. It does happen, but it's, it's not very common. So what's this about the network? Way back in the early days of DNS, uh, DNS used small packets on UDP port 53. That's been obsolete since 1999. However, many packet filters have not yet caught up. Lots of embedded devices, naive cable modems, virtual switches. Uh, in the last couple years, I have seen Internet of Things devices and inexpensive routers with allow RFC 2671 DNS defaulted to off. Any of this will break your network for DNSSEC. So there's this handy thing called the ORC reply size tester. Uh, and you just send a query and it will tell you how big of a query can pass through this device. The, the top one is taken from a VM out on the internet, 4096 buffer size is, is what you would like to see. The one on the bottom is taken from a, host, a virtual host behind a, uh, a virtual box virtual switch. And I'm told there's a way to fix that, but for the moment, uh, I couldn't use virtual box for testing. If your query size is too small, stop, fix this before proceeding. And watch this after network maintenance. Uh, years ago, I saw Cisco IOS updates that broke DNSSEC. I would like to say that they've learned their lesson and would never do that again. Uh, I would like to say that. So, put all this together and you get three possible states your zone could be in. They're secure. The zone has working DNSSEC validation. Everything is happy. There's insecure, where the zone is authoritative, but it has no DNSSEC. It's running on the internet just like it's 1983. And then there's bogus. Bogus is a technical term for DNSSEC. And the zone has C DNSSEC, but does not validate. What causes bogosity? Uh, one thing is clock skew. The signatures have expired or are not yet valid. And the other is a DS record mismatch. And the easiest way to see this is one of the online DNSSEC debuggers. I like DNSViz because it is clear and obvious. There are others out there, however, and an internet search will reveal dozens of them, and one of them will conform to your mental prejudices. So, the first thing you should do is, when you're studying a debugging tool, is use the debugging tool on normal things that work before trying to look at brokenness. So here we have, at the top of this chart, the root zone has a key, we trust that key, it signs another key, it signs a DS, which falls into the dot-com zone, which uh, has the two keys again and a DS, and that falls down onto the DNS key for tiltedwindmillpress.com. And here everything works, everything is happy. And here is another perfectly acceptable working zone that happens to not have DNSSEC. Uh, one of my test domains. 
and you can see the top parts of the chain of trust are all there, but there's an NSEC3 record uh, point saying that there is no DS record. So what we have here is an insecure zone that's exactly as secure as DNS has been for the last 30, 40 years. Now here is something a little different. This zone, I added a DNS key to that same zone. And the parent zone does not know about it yet. This key is rumored because other hosts could not have cached it yet. But since there's no DS in the parent zone, it won't validate. So basically, this is what your zone should look like if you've turned on DNSSEC in the name server but haven't told the parent zone. Everything seems fine. Once you tell the parent zone about the DS record, you'll get the full chain just like we saw two slides ago. All that's very nice, but what about a failure? Well, again, dnssecfail.org. The DS, if you look here, it points to DNS key tag number 106. The key in the zone itself has tag 29521. Remember, a tag is a, a new, short numerical identifier that is unique within the zone. The keys tags do not match. Therefore, this zone is invalid and will not validate. So, take from the top. How do you debug a zone? One, verify the network. Two, verify the clock. Three, separate DNSSEC from DNS with the plus CD flag. You want to know if it is a generic DNS problem or if it's DNSSEC specific. And if it is not a timing or a key mismatch, uh, go to uh, DNS viz, put your zone in, see what it complains about. If there's nothing obvious there, it could be a client or a software bug. Now one catch with DNS is when other people screw up. Suppose you are a critical business partner for my company and you have service level agreements that you must meet or my assembly line shuts down. Never mind that I've specifically designed my business to never have that class of problem, but it could happen. Uh, say if you're, if you're working, however, with Ford Motor Company and they screw up their DNS, there are real penalties attached to that. So a negative trust anchor is something you can do to say, I know this zone is bogus, but disable checking on it. We're, they screwed up, we're, we're going to live with it. And by putting in a negative trust anchor, bind will check the zone for validity every five minutes. When it validates, it cancels the NTA. NTAs expire in an hour. You can expend that with the lifetime flag. Uh, here I've given or here you've given me 24 hours to fix my, fix my DNS sec. So this is a useful tool to have in your pocket because people screw up. So one topic that's hotly debated is key rollover, changing keys. The longer a key is used and the more data is signed with the key, the more time and opportunity an intruder has to break it. it. You should replace KSKs and ZSKs periodically to maintain security. And the goal in rollovers is to maintain a valid chain of trust despite the caching. 
And the only reason this works is that extra signatures and keys don't matter so long as any one of them creates a complete chain of trust. And there's a, a couple different kinds of rollovers you have to worry about. We'll talk about ZSKs first. Your zone ZSK is signed by the KSK. This is entirely internal. The outside world is not involved. Roll anytime you want. If you are using this kind of policy, there are folks who roll over their ZSK every month because they can. Now a CSK and a KSK rollover, a, the parent zone's DS points at the key tag and the fingerprint. So you must update the parent zone and allow new records to propagate before killing old keys. This involves timing and verifying time to live. Uh, it's not hard, it's just annoying, and you can check the book if you want the gory formulas. So how, how often should you rotate? This is a hotly debated topic. Uh, it's a great way to start a fight in a bar if you have a sysadmin bar. Uh, there are folks who would say never, never. Uh, how often do you rotate your SSH server keys? And really what this comes down to is what is your threat model? If you are one of these sites where you collect personal data, you're a valuable target, lots of money at hand, uh, perhaps risk to people even, rotate it yearly. Whenever an algorithm is deprecated, you must rotate. Primordial zone keys used MD5, which is no longer useful. And, and people should not trust it anymore. So you, you have to rotate when that happens. Now, my opinion is that any process that is never used rots and it gets scary and we don't want to do it. And it turns into a big deal. So I would tell you to rotate your keys yearly. But it may be you're willing to let your CSK on your personal domain sit there for 10 years uh, and deal with it when ECDSA uh, 256 or whatever you're using gets broken. That's your choice. When you're rolling over keys, DNS viz is your friend and patience is your spouse. Here's a zone uh, one of my test zones, and it has two DNS keys. We're rolling over from one to the other. And you'll see even in .org, they have another DNS key record on standby. So in general, give everything extra time. Uh, remember back in the 90s, AOL violated caching times on DNS records and kept expired stuff around. And host companies had horrible problems with AOL because they were ignoring that we moved stuff. Um, someday some bright person is going to reinvent that horrible idea. Uh, so give extra time. I'm not going to take you through the exact commands because it all depends on the kind of keys etc. But they're fairly straightforward Unix incantations. Some other things you can do with DNSSEC. You can delegate your own child zones. You can do DNSSEC on internal zones like 10 slash 8 and 192.168 slash 16. That's kind of fun. You can distribute application data over DNS. Uh, like SSH host keys. Stop being prompted for those annoying please verify this key message. VPN keys, auto configure your clients. TLSA for X509 certificates. A lot of mail servers use that. So we're going to take some questions and answers now. I should be on live following this presentation so we can babble a bit until the next talk. There is the book, it exists. There are lots more books. 
and please everybody get your shots and stay home as much as you can and avoid people so perhaps we can have a meat space BSD can next year. Thank you all for watching. So, let me look at questions in, in the IRC. Uh, yes, Alan, attacking Dan's website by putting false commands in his blog posts and just destroying BSD users across the world would be fantastic. Um, however, you spoiled it by telling us before you did it. So there is that. Is there a thing I'd like to change about DNSSEC? Well, the, if I could change anything related to DNSSEC, the first thing I would do is scour the internet and remove every blog post uh, and every web page written between the years 1990 and say 2018 and get rid of them uh, so that they stop leading people astray. I'm not terribly, I'm, I'm not a cryptographer to have me spout off on algorithms and whatnot would be irresponsible. But I, I will say in general, uh, in general, this is the same design that we use everywhere else a chain of trust is needed. So fine, we live with it. Okay. Any more questions here? Um, no, I think that's it. Oh, what have been the hardest issues for me to diagnose? Uh, The hardest issue for me to diagnose was the time I decided to set up my own NTP server at home behind my cable modem. And I pointed all of my servers, including those on the internet, at it. And promptly forgot I had done that. So a couple years later, I set up DNSSEC and it didn't work. And I chased it and I chased it and finally realized that my NTP server was drifting like mad and feeding bad time to all my servers. And just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Uh, what software do I like to use for hosting my own DNS? I use Bind. Now, the main reason I use Bind is, is one, it's still the most popular DNS server. And two, I learned it in 1995 and I'm an old fart and it just works. Let's see. I think that's all the questions, but since I believe we have a lag in the Zoom, uh, I may regret this, so turn on the sound. What software do I like to Okay, we are not that badly lagging. So I think that's all the questions. I am going to stop sharing and say the talk is over and bid you farewell. <laughs>